Um, thanks for being here today, and it's been some great presentations, so thanks to everybody that's uh, presented uh, before us today. It's been fun learning about the different pieces that have been happening around Moodle. Um, so I am Linda Wright, I'm the Director of Distance Projects. We're a nonprofit, um, and we provide free online distance learning opportunities for adults in Ontario to assist them with upgrading their reading, writing, and math, and other essential skills. Um, we did celebrate 20 years of online learning this year as well. It was exciting to hear Moodle um, also celebrated their 20th year as well. We are funded uh, by the province of Ontario through the Ministry of Labour, Immigration, Training, and Skills Development. So our target audience is working with Indigenous communities, organizations, and ind individuals to identify and meet their learning goals in our flexible online learning environment. In Ontario, we have a number of communities that are fly-in only, um, that are Indigenous communities in Northern Ontario that we also work with. When learning with GLA, our courses are 100% online, so oftentimes we never meet our learners. Ontario is huge, I don't know if you know much about it, but you can drive 24 hours and you're still in the same province, so it's a massive area to cover. Our courses are all free to adults across Ontario, and we offer a combination of live and independent online options. We've been using Moodle for about 15 years uh, to develop our own curriculum, and currently we offer about 30 courses. We know that Moodle Mood is often a love fest to Moodle, so why we love Moodle is it's open source, again, being nonprofit, that's very cost beneficial to us. We're managed by Contact North, so all we really have to look after is doing, um, looking after our users as well as um, instructing as well. When you talked about 700 users in one course, I just about had a panic attack. But uh, anyhow, we build our own curriculum, um, and, we, and it's great for us because oftentimes we can't find a curriculum with an indigenous content in it, especially when we're talking about essential skills. We've added H5P activities, which we love because it makes it more interactive. And when we use the main Moodle tools, it's often easy to update the courses as we need to as content changes. A wish list for us in case there's anybody out here listening, is a really good, easy-to-use text-to-speech tool um, and a preferred, preferred name option that continues through the whole platform, which we're also looking at as well. But why corrections in literacy? Well, we know that a lot of those that are within corrections facilities, and I put on stats for the numbers people, but are one of the barriers is education and that offenders typically return to prison due to education being one of those factors. For us, um, the government of Ontario started a corrections literacy initiative about five years ago and my ears started to listen for it a little bit. And why it's important to us is because we're the Indigenous stream for literacy in Ontario as part of the eChannel program. And there's just a huge over-representation of Indigenous people in the criminal justice system in Canada. Um, and this is only increasing over time. So we're located in Sioux Lookout, Ontario, and the closest corrections facility is Kenora. And it was estimated that 89% of the inmates there were Indigenous, and 90% of them are presumed innocent. Many of these are coming from northern communities. Um, it's maybe sometimes the first time they've left. English is often a second language. And they're, they're, we saw this as an opportunity to connect with those clients while they're in the corrections facility and perhaps introduce them to good learning anywhere and opportunities within um, the education. And when they go back to their community, they could continue with us. We know that digital technology is important, but when you're dealing with corrections, they're really caught between really legitimate um, security concerns. In Kenora, there was a riot and one of our guards was taken prisoner during that. Um, to come in and say, hey guys, we want them to use a computer, well, they really are feel fearful for situations that are quite serious. Um, we really have to work with the facility to ensure that we're, we're taking their concerns seriously and understand where it lies within the priority, but also express to them that digital literacy is really important. So an example is one of the first, I'm gonna give you some examples that we've worked with. But just an example of some of the things that are, when we go and we talk to a site is that there was guaranteed, no, absolutely no access to the internet in some of our youth systems, which makes it a little challenging when you want to do online learning. Um, there was no camera or hardware on any of the material or any of the hardware that we were using. 
and that it had to be educational content um, and that it had to be very independent to use for not only the client but also the staff. Oftentimes, something like this, a project like this, is downloaded to someone who has already a gazillion pieces that they're trying to work within the system. And so it had to be very easy to train, very easy for them to use because they were the ones that were also being asked the questions. One of the issues we do have, this is just examples of one of the youth justice systems, is across Ontario, we really don't have one guiding voice over what that education looks like within a corrections facility, whether it's a youth system or the provincial system. I'm getting there. I had my first meeting with one of the higher ups in the provincial, so we're talking about that and what that looks like, and they're looking at an LMS, and I'm pitching Moodle very hard to them. Um, but it's, so every time we talk to somebody, it's usually the newest person that's walked in the facility that's all fresh-faced and excited. They're gonna, they're gonna make this happen. Um, and then each system has, a, each each corrections facility has different rules, they have different ideas of what they want. And so each time you go somewhere, you're really starting brand new and you're educating not only them, but what, what is going to work within their facility. So these are some of our pilot projects we've worked with. Um, John Howard Society in Thunder Bay was a really one of our first um, introductions to corrections. And we started having Super Tuesday. So it's a transition house and we go in and we cook soup with them. Um, and then also we'd say, and how about you learn a little bit about digital technology? And we had what I'll talk about a little bit more is a roomy tablet. But they did have access to the internet there. And what we were able to do is actually run the Moodle courses that we had on the tablet. And they were able to, would you like some soup? Please take a course too. So we were able to kind of co combine those two things and started to learn a little bit about corrections and what kind of courses were needed and the kind of support that was needed. We then worked with the youth justice system um, in southern Ontario and again they could use our, our regular Moodle courses on the computers and then they had the tablet for offline use. Our newest one is with the federal government. What we're finding with the federal government is there is more of a consistency across but again it's been very hands-off on any access to technology for inmates. If you're in the federal system you're in for five years or more. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that one because I'm most excited about that what's happening right now is that we haven't got any funding for this project. It's really been James and I connecting through a session like this talking about what we could do and they were looking for some literacy and Indigenous curriculum. And so what we've started to do is download our courses from Moodle and then we send them to the core can. Um, which is basically the educational and training um, group in the federal system. Unfortunately, they're not using Moodle. I'm still pitching it hard, but the staff work with inmates, which is really kind of neat because they're getting coding experience as they take these courses and they make them D2L compatible. And I don't know if D2L is a bad word here, but um, it's what they're using, so it's what we're working with. Um, and they're using it in a whitelist environment. So any of our courses that have external links, they're having to take that and find other solutions, whether it's a screenshot or they're recreating that material. But the staff, which I think is really neat, is we're working with the inmates to do that. So then they have the inmates that have been piloting them, and they're getting really positive feedback. And so at this point, we started telling the higher-ups of what we were doing, and we're getting some really good support on it. Um, and so now what's happening is the staff there is supporting the registrations, they send them to us, and as they finish a course, it's automatically alerting us that a course has been completed, and then we send a certificate to the client. Again, because it's corrections, it's really hands-off for us. We have to rely on the staff there and the systems that they do have in place. Again, they're expanding across Ontario, which is fantastic. We're only supposed to be servicing those people in Ontario. They're looking at going across Canada, and so that's something we're trying to figure out how a provincial organization is going to have our, our courses across Canada. So now we're getting into the red tape of it, but it's been exciting to see how far we've been able to go. So one of the biggest issues we have and the question I get is, well, that's great, but I don't have any internet, so how do I access your courses? And this has been something that I've struggled with over the years. 
Um, and I've basically been saying, I'm sorry, I can't help you. Um, again, living in northern Ontario, living in a remote community, or being in a corrections facility, they still need digital skills. And thanks to COVID, even more so now. Um, so we've really been looking for a solution for that. In Ontario, one of the things that came out, the ministry wanted, um, has this Corrections Literacy Initiative. And to me, the words that jumped out with this was digital skills. Again, when you're in the corrections facility, and especially in, in smaller ones like Kenora, there is no access to the internet. So how are we getting digital skills to these clients? So I was at another conference, and somebody came up and said, have you heard of the Rumi tablet? And I said no. Um, but it was actually a tablet that was being used in uh, third world countries. Uh, that content was being downloaded onto. Um, and, um, but it's more like a library. It wasn't very interactive. So you could download apps. You could download YouTube videos. You could load, download PDF. But there was no interactivity or no learning that was happening. However, we've been using these for five years. Um, within the Kenora facility, and I put that picture in because I told Nikki I'd bring her to Barcelona. So that's our, our crew from the Kenora um, facility, which none of these projects would work without somebody on the ground. Um, the people on the ground are fantastic in what they do, but often, um, I think the presenter before was talking about not a lot of technical skills sometimes in those people that are delivering the courses or even handing over the tablet. And they're in Kenora, and I'm in Toronto. Again, we're in Ontario. For me to go to drive to them, it's 24 hours. So I also have to be able to train them at a distance, too, because I really don't like getting on the little puddle jumper planes to go see them. Um, so it has to be extremely easy to use. Uh, so we have been using it for five years. The hardware, uh, Rumi's no longer using the hardware. Um, and we were using these tablets to use the Moodle with internet. So we're looking for a solution right now to replace this because they're coming end of life right now. What we did like about them is we could curate material for different groups on it. I could have different libraries. So in Kenora, we also have a, we did have a women's floor. Um, and so we were able to curate um, specific curriculum um, identified for indigenous women as well. So this was just, again, We've moved through, and each project that we do, we learn more. Um, corrections is kind of like this, A, sometimes people look at me and go, why? Why do you do this? Um, but it's also just this kind of closed room where you have to get in, you have to build trust. They don't want just anybody coming in and, and trying to push stuff on them. So you've really had to do it. So now we're looking at, okay, we've been able to do a few things in facilities. We've played around with offline. Rumi has, the tablet has been fairly successful, and now what's up for us? So our next steps are to continue to explore the Moodle off, app offline. Um, again, it has to be, I've been taking our courses and putting them into the app and looking at it. Um, I've been testing it out with um, the people you saw from Kenora. And at this point, it's not as user friendly um, to be able to use it, to be able to just kind of hand it over. A lot of the, our course content, and this is what happens, this is where I get caught in two worlds. So there's some really great tools. And every time we hear about something, and you guys said that, people get all excited about them. And I love when my instructors do this, because then I have to go and learn something too, which is pros and cons. Um, and they throw in a new tool. But all these fun little add-ons to it, when you take something and then you're going to try to download it and put it into a different environment, don't work. Um, and so we're, right now we're going through our courses and seeing what does work and doesn't work well in the app offline to try to figure out, okay, do we have to just rebuild entire courses that are offline or can we take our content, kind of like they're doing in the federal project, and just rebuild it? Um, we are looking at ways to make navigating the app easier for staff and clients as well. I have, I have clients within the system that are a grade two reading level, English as a second language, and maybe have used a cell phone. And so that needs to be very easy for the staff and it needs to be very easy for the clients. We need to be, we're gonna to continue to again, look at those building those courses that can be used offline and in those whitelist situations as well. 
And we're going to explore partnerships to whitelist Moodle with sites instead of having to go over to D2L. Um, so I'm going to meet with the province and really try to see if we can work something with them to, to be able to build something that can be then put down into the system rather than build each individually in each system and then build up. So I think I'm a little bit early, Mary, but this is my contact information. Um, if you have any questions about it or any ideas for me, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. Um, I love people who finish early. I was, I was, the thing is, I almost warned you when we arrived. I was a high school teacher for 28 years before I started working for Moodle, and I absolutely insist that everything goes on time. I used to know even instinctively when the school bell was going to go for the next lesson. So if you can finish early, that's good, right? It, and everyone has been really good with time so far, and we only have one presentation left. Uh, but I've said, if you were late, I was literally going to push you out of the way and move on to the next person. Fortunately for you, that hasn't happened, but it, it is good because it does mean we now have some time, um, first of all, for some questions. So I'm sure you've got lots of questions about this initiative. So I'm going to pass back to Linda. And if you have a question, make sure that the microphone gets to you first. Um, are tools like Starlink improving connectivity uh, in these areas? Is, is that going to solve some of this problem for you? That's a great question. Um, so start, actually, it's been great for some of our staff. Our staff is located all across Ontario as well. Um, and in some of the communities, um, and actually in some of our, um, my parents live about two hours away from me, and they're actually just getting internet now that they can watch Netflix on. Um, we have communities in Northern Ontario that are flying that actually have an um, internet infrastructure to it. The problem is having the people in the community that know that this, this was unplugged or, or like keeping the internet going within the community is one of the struggles we have when we're, we're working on remote projects. Um, so Starlink, I don't know if it'll help. It's definitely not gonna help within the facilities because it's more an administration issue in the aspect of, um, so, in January, I had somebody contact me and say they'd really like to have one of our Exploring First Nations courses within the facility. I said, that's great, how can we do this? We brainstormed a little bit. So we recorded one of our live classes in a clean recording. So there's no other instructor, or there's no other students, there was no identifying um, information about the instructor. And we basically took that recording and sent it to her. It took her over six months to get the permission to play that in a classroom. And there was no internet connectivity. So when we're dealing with these projects, it's almost, an, it's almost a no all the time to get internet connectivity. And it's more in the aspect of they have it within the facility for administration, but they're not allowing um, clients to have it because again, public safety, we don't want perhaps somebody that's in a facility to have full access to the internet. So trying to do that safely is what we're working with them now. But yeah, Starlink's in, in Ontario and it's a great thing, but yeah. Well, this is not a question, it's more a comment. So my name is Juan Leiva, I am the uh, Moodle Labs product manager. So we would like to see what you are doing with the, the tests, you are doing with the mobile application to check how it works offline. Uh, so we are downstairs, so if you can visit us and yes, have a conversation about that, we would love to see what you are doing and how can we improve the, how can we improve the app and, yeah, and help you if you need help. Okay, course. that's great. Thank you very much. Yeah, I was also just going to comment that we had a great deal of difficulty even in North Carolina, the United States, with internet connectivity, particularly during the pandemic. Mm. So we do have some remote areas, but even more so, we had situations where students were home with their brothers and sisters, mother and father, and somebody streaming a video and whatever, and we actually had a number of students fail as a result of that. Right. So it is a serious issue. We really saw our numbers change um, during the pandemic in the aspect of our metrics. We saw a lot of um, those people that had multi-barriers, like they're on... Um, Ontario Works or ODS, Ontario Disability, those numbers really significantly dropped and we identified it as a lot of the centers that they would usually go to access um, free internet or, or use hardware um, were closed. And we saw a lot more people um, or um, those people who had 
one computer, so you had to choose whether your kid or you take the course today, right? So we saw that that kind of decline in multi-barrier clients and a rise in people that were like, I'm bored, I'm gonna take a course. Hey, we have four computers, I'm gonna take one of your stuff. So our, th that really changed. We're starting to see that as things are opening up back in Canada, change a little bit as well. Um, so we're excited to see some of those clients come back. Okay. Um, yeah, so um, first is to say I'm, I'm really impressed to know that uh, in Canada also there are places where you're really trying to use Moodle app offline because it's part of um, what we do a lot in some of very remote places in Kenya. And I was just wondering, when you say it's, the app is not very user friendly, would you pinpoint like two or three specific things that you'd really like to see in the app in terms of navigation? And then the next question is, in terms of monitoring of, um, you know, how the content is being used by the uh, client, as you call them, do you have a plan for that to, to be able to know whether the content was actually used by the people? And if so, what kind of tools are you using? Because one of the things we, we're really struggling with, and I'm really happy to hear this, the Moodle app developer around here is getting analytics uh, from usage offline? That's a great question because both of those are things we're struggling with too. Um, so the Moodle, um, so the, with the Moodle app, the thing I liked about the Rumi tablet um, was the aspect that it, there's not a lot, we, well, we worked hard with Rumi to make sure that there wasn't a lot of fringe information. Like it was, here's my course, or not my course at that point, but here's the library, here's the content, that we could organize that very clearly. And there wasn't a lot of um, navigation that had to happen to get them right into the tablet. Um, so when I'm on the Moodle app, there's a lot of, okay, I have to sometimes I have to download this, and I, there's a lot of stuff that has to happen. And, and I'm looking to see, much like when I altered the Rumi tablets, um, is if there's ways I can do that on my end to make it very easy once I present the tablet to the site. As far as pulling off analytics, I'm really hoping, um, I haven't found anything yet, I'm really hoping we could do that. Um, with the tablets, the Rumi tablets, and again, what we would do is they would be offline, and then when they, um, in, within the facility, and that would happen, and when it would come and it would get connected outside the facility and connected, it would send us up some analytics. Again, I couldn't pull specific things. Um, it was more like time, like used on what they were viewing, so it helped us decide what content we wanted to further develop or what we didn't. My hope is that will be able to, um, like in my dream world, these, these are, this is Linda's dreams, but um, is that it would be like learner one would be attached to this client, but we wouldn't probably get any identifying information, but that, that client, um, we would be able to put in some sort of test where it would test their knowledge until they got 100% on the, on the quiz, and that would tell us that then they could move to the next piece. Um, is what I'm hoping is some sort of course that we can design within it um, so that when we see a course complete, we know that they have um, been able to um, complete all kind of the knowledge checks within that course. And that's how the Corcan one is doing it, the federal one. When they're rebuilding them, they're just doing that they have to complete it to get to the next activity. And when they complete the course, they have demonstrated they have the knowledge. Yeah. Thanks. Um, hi. Hi. Uh, Julie from Kenya, interestingly, but um, representing a company that's by G, uh, so uh, a product by GIZ in Germany. So it's called Atingi, and we actually have a, a concept called Atingi in a box, which is uh, using Raspberry Pi. And you would have this where when you have access to the internet, you have the courses downloaded. So if you have um, the courses that you wanted to introduce, they'd be downloaded there and then you have access to them where it's now offline and it's, I think it uses Wi-Fi connection or something like that. We can talk about it later. Um, what's interesting is um, that yesterday we had this same exact conversation um, on how to improve the mobile app in a way that you're loading less or that you're having, not necessarily changing the whole product that is Moodle because most users 
want to access faster, but to think about maybe the global south and um, different areas that we are targeting because Atingi is supposed to help improve employability in Africa, in South America, in parts of Asia. And so it's, that was the discussion that was going on yesterday when we were thinking about user experience and can we make tweaks to, for example, the parts of the code in order for preventing some reloading or do you load everything all at the same time without having to consume so much of the internet and still be able to store this. So I'm excited that someone else is following up on this discussion. So yeah, I will, I will be following you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. I've always said that, you know, what is that called? Um, like Candy Crush or whatever, you could play it while you're in the subway and don't have internet connectivity and you can play it while you're at home and it's connected and that was my wish to have something that was that seamless. So it's good to hear that things are happening. Hi, uh, my name is Lauren um, from Moodle US. Uh, this was an awesome presentation. Thank you for sharing and just also for just bringing this topic um, of learning in, in corrections facilities. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be presenting on a course that I've recently built for UNESCO, for the UNESCO Institute for Lifelong Learning. And we designed it to be used completely offline in the mobile app, um, as well as printed and in sort of like any kind of learning environment you can think of. Um, and that session's at noon tomorrow. We designed it to be really practical, so I've just like went through all the sort of like course design strategies we used. Um, and we kept it really simple so that it's all self-contained in Moodle, uses core Moodle tools. So little plug for that session, but also just wanted to say hi and would be happy to like talk at any point. Thank you. Yeah, definitely save me a seat there because I think I have that one stored on my agenda. So I'm excited to hear that that's going to be talked about. So that's fantastic. Thank you.